Rocky the Rig. For those who don't know horses, a rig is a horse that has been improperly gelded. It is the nature of such horses to be fractious, possessed as they are of the stallion's willfulness, while having had shocked out of them through the experience of the gelding that attachment to mankind which is part of equine nature and the secret of man's ability to subject the species such a horse was the roan entered that year for the Catherine River Cup under the name of Rocky everybody who knew anything much about him called him Rocky the Rig it was through his intractability that Rocky the Rig got that first name of his. It came to him out of a bitter remark made by the horse breaker at Laura Punya Station, who was the first to try a hand at the futility that man was his master. That horse ain't normal flesh and blood. He's made a rock. I doubt if you could put a bullet in him. On the stations where sentiment about animals is subordinate to economics, a bullet is the usual penalty for the beast that refuses to cooperate in the general purpose. The attempt to exact the penalty in the case of Rocky the Rig was made so often that it came to be believed that he bore a charmed life. He certainly strained his chances of survival. Unlike most outlaw horses, he did not shun men, his enemies, but continually provoked their enmity by intruding on homesteads and mustering camps, not only to stir up rebellion amongst his more docile brethren and lead them away, through the gates he had opened and the fences he had broken to a spell of freedom in the wilderness, but to burgle their food stores. He acquired his taste for human provender from his mother, a pack mare, with whom, as a foal, he used to hang about the homestead and stock camps of Larapanya. As a foal, he was a pretty thing, with his golden, glowing, red-blue hide and auburn brush of a tail and mane, and as such was a great pet. It was in this happy state that he became addicted to that passion of his for fermented foodstuffs and beverages which eventually compelled him to make a truce with men. It began with his eating the sponge of bread made on the stations out of a strong fermentative mixture of hops and boiled potato. Soon he was burgling kitchens and stock camp store tents for the bottled ferment itself. It was said that he had been seen staggering drunk from gorging on overripe mangoes, but the things they said about Rocky the Rig, he was credited with ability to open any gate and even to turn door handles. Whatever the truth of that, he was once found jammed between two trees with a double gate hanging round his neck that he had lifted from its hinges five miles away. Those who found him on that occasion might easily have put to the test the idea that he was bulletproof. They refrained because he appeared to be at his last gasp already. The moment they released him, he was up and off. Curiously, no one who had early dealings with Rocky ever thought of him as likely to make a race horse. This was despite that fine turn of speed 
which probably had more to do than anything with the prolongation of his existence as an outlaw, as well as the fact that his sire, Black Bruce, the imported Larapunya stud stallion, was of racing stock. But then a horse's prowess as a racer is judged only with someone on his back. No one had ever stayed on Rocky's back long enough to give thought to anything but the problem of staying there, or of getting off, unharmed. No one, that is, till he fell in with humans of his own unconforming kind, those scallywags, the half-caste Rorys. The Rorys lived on the outskirts of the old mining township of Golden Gully, the outskirts being the proper place for a colored family. However, being thus located actually redounded to their great advantage, for as the town shrunk in size with passing of prosperity, they came to be left in sole occupation of the best bit of land in the district, thanks to the sense of responsibility for them of him to whom they owed their white blood, the late Ignatius Rory. Eventually, that land became theirs by legal title. Many attempts had been made to dispossess them with the aim of ridding the district of what were generally considered a mob of pests. They would not budge. Old Rory had taught them, amongst much else, that gave them distinction, that their very integrality depended on their sticking together as a clan. Most likely, without the old man's advice, they would have stuck to the place just as stubbornly because their aboriginal instincts demanded a tribe and tribal territory. Their family was their tribe, and Roryville, as most people called the place, was their beloved stamping ground. The way old Rory reared his family to consider themselves as good as any one and better than most was certain to lead to trouble in those parts. While he lived, he could stave it off with his restraining influence on his progeny and his standing in the white community. By the time he passed away, the problem had quadruplica quadruplicated with the addition of another generation to the clan. After the old man died, the family became virtual outlaws. Several of the second generation became outlaws, in fact. Practically all of the grown males, and not a few of the females, fell foul of the law eventually. Disorderly conduct was their commonmost offense, meaning to say more or less violent disputation with people who presumed to be their betters. It was mostly while away from home that they behaved worst, at any rate in respect of violence. At home they mostly indulged their propensity for theft. Thieving was an essential part of the economics of Roryville in latter days. It was impossible to maintain such a mob as was usually there on the produce of so small a prosperity. Anyway, those of the district who had superabundance in the way of goats and fowls and pigs of watermelons, sweet potatoes, pawpaws, should have looked after their property better than they did. As a lawful occupation, they did a bit of gold mining. However, they sold most of the gold they won to illicit buyers. They were also supposed to be lawfully occupied as grazers. 
in that pursuit their nearest neighbor, Larapunya Station, bore most of the brunt of their preference for operating outside the law. Not far from Golden Gully was a region of rough r ranges, part of the Larapunya Run, in which stock that eluded the seasonal mustering took refuge. As it was just about impossible to ride in the region, and anyway, the cattle must come out eventually when the water failed. Lara Punya stockmen mostly did not bother about the place. Not so the Rorys. They would go in after the scrubbers on foot and work them like a pack of dingoes, even to howling so as to get cows to plant their clean skin calves and would bring out everything without a brand, carrying what was too young to walk and putting it on goat's milk when they got it home. It was while out on such excursions that the Rorys first became acquainted with Rocky the Rig. Rocky also made use of the ranges in his defiance of humanity, and with that considerable horse sense of his, he might have formed the impression that the Rorys were different from those he knew of their kind, since at least they did not harass him. Even if Rocky failed to sense the difference then, he must have got it later on, when in the course of his wanderings he found the clan at home and experienced their unusual forbearance in the matter of dealing with dumb animals. Such forbearance is aboriginal. Roryville was like a black fellow's camp with its pack of dogs and cats of all sorts, and conditions that the family would have no more dreamt of culling than they would have of eliminating wizened little old black grandma Ninul or any other of the old or sick of their own excessive numbers. About the place were crippled peewees and crows and a kite and an aged emu and also a huge dropsical pig, and a badly foundered mare. Th that mare, called Lame Lass by the Rorys, bore the brand of Laura Punya Station. She had crippled herself irreparably in a fall into a railway cattle grid during trucking operations at Golden Gully Siding, because the extent of her injury had not been realized. At first, she had been left behind to recover. At last, starving through inability to get about, she somehow made her painful way to Roryville, where she was at once admitted, when eventually the Laura Punya people came looking for her and saw her condition they wanted to shoot her. To the Rorys, that would be equivalent to murder. In the aboriginal way, they could kill without qualm to eat, or even with some concession to the other side of their inheritance, to sell. But any other kind of killing to them <clears throat> was wanton. They pleaded for lame lass's life on the ground that she might recover, and so were left with her. Rocky the Rig always won for the female of his species soon found lame lass, and in doing so learned more of the strange forbearance of this odd group of humans, the Rorys. His interest in other people's mares was elsewhere treated just like his assaults on their food stores. The Rorys even had the delicacy to withdraw when they perceived that being unable to lead Lame Lass away, he was nervous in courting her there in the home paddock with them about. He did not have to burgle their food store, because he found he could feed without danger 
along with lame lass and the old goats and the pig and the emu. If nothing else about these people drew Rocky to them, it would be this generous feeding. Not only was it largely the human food he loved, but often included the beery stuff he was mad about. The Rorys were great makers and drinkers of homebrew beer. They had to be in order to feel that they were as good as others, because most of them, by reason of bad behavior, were debarred as aboriginal persons from consumption of alcohol. It was through this happy association of Rocky with Lame Lass that the fact of his being an entire, which is to say a stallion, was discovered. Lame Lass bore a foal that could not have been other than his. This proof was very necessary for overcoming the prejudice against Rocky that would have prevented his eventual rehabilitation as a worthy associate of humankind. Such a creature, unable to, to be a slave of men, could associate with them only as a power in his own right, as a champion, that is, as a racehorse. But for the proof of his entirety, he sure would have been debarred from entry for that test of the champion horses of the North, the classic race, the Catherine River Cup. The racing committee began by rejecting his nomination on the ground that, as a rig, he was what their rules declared to be, an animal of object objectionable nature. It was curious <clears throat> that to support them in their protest against Rocky's rejection, the Rorys had to call on one who could have been expected to be the worst possible advocate for either themselves or the horse. That was Roy, Roy Kingaroy, manager of La Rupunya Station. Roy Kingaroy's involvement in the affairs of Rocky And the Rorys began with a visit to Roryville that he made at the request of the police officer stationed at Golden Gully. The policeman was new to the district, but not to the notorious Rorys. He had previously called it Roryville in the course of investigating the alleged theft of a bale of lucerne hay from a railway wagon which bail had been in the process of consignment to Laura Punya to feed the station's race horses. If indeed the Rorys stole the lucerne, it might have been with the excuse that they were feeding two of the Laura Punya horses. Anyway, <clears throat> the policeman found no trace of it, but he did see the two horses and their brands <clears throat> and reckoned he had a case of illegal working stock. He would have taken the horses along as exhibit, a had he been able. As it was, he arrested the five male and three female Rorys, who gave him the most cheek, then got on the phone to Roy Kangaroy. If the telephone line out to Lara Punya hadn't been so bad that day, Kingaroy might have understood how matters were and would have told the officer to release his prisoners, much as he would be pleased at that time to know that any of the Rory clan were under restraint. Instead, he came in to Golden Gully next day. The moment Kingaroy clapped eyes on Rocky, he shouted, Here, I want that horse shot. That supposed charm still worked for Rocky. The policeman had not brought a gun, and the Rorys refused to produce one. The Rorys argued, What you want to shoot a horse for? 
that horse is a public pest. Man can't shoot horse. Horse like mate to man. That horse is no mate to any man. He's a rogue. He's a no-good nuisance. I want him shot, I tell you. Barney Rory yelled, Well, you can't shoot him here. This our property. The policeman roared, Don't be cheeky. Who be in cheeky, copper. That'll do, or I'll run you in. You have a go, mug. Old hooky Rory, the eldest, and always the peacemaker, got in between them, and having quieted them somewhat, asked of King Arroy, "'Spose you don't want that horse, mister. What about you sell him? I'm me feller, eh?' "'Sell him? I'll sell you his hide for two bob after I've put a bullet in him. Come on, what about selling him? And have him running off my horses and driving my camp cooks mad and can't do anything about it because he doesn't belong to me any more, not flaming likely. We won't let him give you no trouble, boss. How you going to stop that rogue doing anything he wants? Ah, uh, we'll break him in some time. You'll never break that jigger in so long as your stern hangs downward. Young Marty Rory, Hookie's son, and the one to whom Rocky had taken most, said, We'll break him all right, mister. Kangaroy, getting tired of arguing with this argumentative mob, turned from them growling. Anyone who can break that four-legged hunk of rock is on a hundred quid. Marty cried, I'll take you, mister. Kangaroy turned and eyed him. Marty added, If I break him, I want to keep him, too. Kangaroy snapped, Listen, boy, if you can break that cow, I'll not only give you the hundred and the horse and a brand new saddle to put on him, but I'll see to it you get all the Laura Punya horse-breaking for good. The ring of shiny black eyes in copper-brown faces staring at Kingaroy shifted their gaze to Marty, who swallowed, then said, somewhat huskily, Okay, mister, I break him all right. Kingaroy stared at him, after a moment said, I'll give you just a week to do it. The man who can't master a horse in a week will never master that horse. Fair enough. Marty nodded. King Roy went on. I'll be back next Tuesday, and I'll bring the police officer with me to shoot him for the public pest he is. Unless you can prove you've broken him by riding him three times round this paddock of yours, and out that gate without him pelting you. Okay, I'll be seeing you. Roy, Kangaroy, was not really a hard man. He only acted the big boss, the squatter. But had he been less concerned with striking a pose that day at Roryville, he would probably have learnt from the Rorys themselves that the breaking in of Rocky was already well enough advanced to make his wager sound. Like a giveaway to them, and hence he would not have been so rash. Marty had not mastered Rocky, nor had tried to do so, but in something like a week had won his trust to the degree of being allowed to ride him round the home paddock bareback and without a bridle. It was now only a matter of getting Rocky <clears throat> to accept the saddle and bridle as convenience in the cooperation between his friend, the rider, and himself, rather than as the bonds of enslavement as which apparently he had come to regard them. But Rocky might have understood the wager himself the way he behaved during that crucial week, to be sure the first two saddles attached to him he went off with 
over the fences and away, and removed them in his own style, with the help of a couple of trees. Even after accepting saddle and bridle and rider, he was, as likely as not, suddenly to take it into his head that he was being imposed upon, and to dump the impostor without ceremony. As a matter of fact, he remained just that little bit suspicious always, even of Marty. Handling him never became a matter of dull routine. However, on the appointed day, when Kingaroy and the policeman arrived at Roryville, there was Rocky standing saddled in the shade of the banyan by the stockyard, dozing like any old camp horse. Marty rode him for half an hour, round the home paddock opened and shut gates from his back, even yarded a bunch of yearlings that had once belonged to Lara Punya. Rocky made a proud show of it, mincing along, arcing his stallion's neck, and champing on the bit. His roan hide gleaming gold and violet in the sun, so impressed was Kingaroy that he approached to lay a hand on Rocky. That was the end of the good behavior. Rocky put him on the run with snapping teeth and flailing hoofs. Then he dumped Marty and departed over the fences and away. Kingaroy conceded the victory and paid up on the spot and promised a new stock saddle by the first train down from Darwin. However, regarding the promised horse-breaking contract, he said that would depend on the Rorys, showing that they would apply themselves to it in a business-like way. They had given him much trouble in the past with their unreliability and their quarrelsomeness, he said, and he was not going to have any more of it. Ordinarily, the Rorys would have reacted violently to talk like that. As it was, delighted with their victory, they ignored it. Even if the Lara Punya contract had been granted to the Rorys unconditionally, almost certainly they would soon have lost interest in it as, with discovery of Rocky's pretty turn of speed, they were seized with the exciting possibility of owning a champion racehorse. They settled down to training Rocky to the exclusion of all other pursuits, except the necessary thieving and the making of home brew. The brewing also became essential to the training, it having been found that Rocky was more tractable if his passion was indulged. His favorite form of indulgence was a bran mash made with beer and treckle. Within six months they had him ready for the round of annual picnic race meetings, Pine Creek, Adelaide River, Victoria River, Brock's Creek. Rocky could always win when he wanted. The trouble was that he did not simply refuse to go out on the track when disinclined to race, but would turn the race into a fight with some other colt, or a love match with a filly, or a public humiliation of Marty, the only one who could handle him at all when it came to racing, by pelting him off either in the parade or at the barrier. He was several times disqualified for bad behavior before a race. A couple of times he entered the camps of station people and stole food. At Adelaide River, he was caught making a burglarious assault on the marquee where the official luncheon was set. The general opinion was that for all his speed, Rocky would never amount to anything because of his willfulness, but the Rorys never lost hope for him because that hope was theirs. As a matter of fact, the general public were more interested in the behavior of the Rorys than in that of their wonder horse. Gatherings of the clan abroad had formerly been regarded rather as calamitous visitations by those into whose midst they went 
such being the trouble that invariably resulted from their association with other people. People were astonished by their comparative amiability. The obvious explanation was the concentration of Rory's interest on their darling. However, most people declared that it was simply that their style was cramped by Rocky's misbehavior. It was understanding of this change that had come over the Rory's that caused Roy Kingaroy to support them in their appeal against exclusion of Rocky from entry for the Catherine Cup talking it over privately with members of the racing committee. He said, I've been watching them closely lately. It's the idea of being important in the community that's changed them. They can have the importance by running a good race horse. They're living in hopes of winning the cup some day. Dash those hopes for them with some piece of prejudice or officialism and they'll be more antisocial than ever. One of the committee men demanded, You don't think that Brumby has a chance of winning the cup, do you? He's not a Brumby. He's half-brother to my mare, Aura Fura Star. King Roy's racing mare, daughter of Black Bruce, out of Pacific Star, a mare that had had great success in metropolitan racing in the South, had won the last Catherine River Cup and was hot favorite to win the next. He added, I don't reckon their horse will win this cup, but he's got a good chance later. He's only rising four and he's pretty good, believe me. He's not a rig, he's a horse. Under that respectable description of Horse Rocky was listed to run for the Catherine Cup. Every member of the Rory clan, from white-haired, wizened black grandma to the last yellow baby, except of course those in jail or on the run, gathered that year at Catherine River. News of their better behavior had got about. Nevertheless, the people of the Catherine were taking no chances. The two hotels increased the force of strong-armed men they usually engaged for race time, and the sergeant of police asked for an extra couple of constables from Darwin and saw to the chains used for restraining prisoners by locking them to trees when the jailhouse overflowed, but the Rory's, with the weight of apprehension on them now that the proving of their great expectations was at hand, were even subdued. There was such a mob of them that their camp, down in the steep-walled gully that was the dry season river bed, made it look as if a circus had come to town. There were tents and bush houses, old cars and trucks, and sulkies and tethered horses ringed about a great communal campfire at which the bright-clad, dark-haired woman cooked while chattering in the soft half cast patois by which the men in sombreros and tight new riding pants and shiny riding boots squatted on hunkers yarning and drawing aboriginal symbols in the sand and about which the copper-skinned children raced and squealed and tumbled with the dogs. Most of them kept out of town. This was a matter of deliberate policy. Obviously, they did not want trouble preoccupied as they were, and those most likely to make it simply avoided temptation. That they were fearful in their preoccupation was evident. They talked of nothing but the race. When conversation flagged, someone would say, What you reckon Rocky 
got a chance A. The argument to prove his chances would be on again. At last, the great day dawned, and in their brightest, shiniest, best, the family climbed up out of the riverbed with their champion and made their way to the race course shimmering in morning mirage on the scarlet plain. Rocky was installed in the bush-roofed stables off the saddling paddock. Most of the grown male Rorys stayed with him to attend his needs, to keep off the flies that might easily put him in bad temper, to walk him whenever he showed the excessive restlessness that invariably culminated in mischief. The rest of the family settled themselves under bush shelters beside the track. As owners, they should be entitled to a place in the grandstand with the rest of the aristocracy of the land, who today were headed by no less a dignitary than his honor, the administrator, down from Darwin. But not even Hooky Rory in whites and Panama and wearing the badge of membership of the racing club, ventured near it. The racing began at ten, although at each parade of horses, from saddling paddock to barrier, the copper-brown faces of the Rorys would crowd the rails, and would stay there while each race was run, quizzing and cranning round the oval track, till the field came thundering in to the finish. From them there was none of the urging, cheering, bemoaning, loss, or shouting victory, as from the rest of the pressing crowd. For the Rorys had but one fancy, and he was being saved for the cup in the afternoon. Every now and again some of them, all of them eventually... Even Black Grandma and the granddaughters with the tiniest babies would go back to take a look at him, would ask each other the eternal question, what you reckon he got chance? The question started no such brave argument now, for there alongside of Rocky were those sleek rivals to his chance, his aristocratic half-sister Dark Brown Arafura Star and Red Robin the big chestnut stallion that had won the cup before last, and the long-legged pure Arab gelding, white chic, fresh from first-class racing in the South. These were odds, their odds were favorites. While Rocky was being called at five to one, all any of the Rorys could say now was, if only he don't play up. Others were expressing themselves similarly, that Rocky, the Riggs, got a good chance, if only he don't play up. But after all the hours of waiting and wishing and the petting lavished on the creature, it looked as if he were going to do just that, play up and ruin everything. Not even beer from the bottle would quell his rising ill temper, although he swigged what they gave him greedily enough. The tempers of his attendants were rising too. Even the patient Marty, sweating in his silks, at last became exasperated to the point of yelling, You flamin' my all, you, you get yourself disqualified this time, I shoot you like everybody else want to do, and feed you to the crows. Poor Marty was shaking, not simply from the stress of the moment, but, but from weakness due to lack of nourishment. He had had to fine down drastically to meet Rocky's listed weight of nine stone two, clang clang, clang gore clang. The jockeys were being called to the weighing out. With saddle and whip, Marty joined the procession to the scales. Amongst the jockeys was Roy Kangaroy, who always rode his own horses, 
As Marty came off the scales, Kingaroy squeezed his arm, saying, Go in and show him, son. Muttering those words to himself, Marty went stumbling away to saddle Rocky. Hooky, helping him with the girths, asked him what he was saying, and when told, cried, That right, go in and show him. The other Rorys there about the champion in the saddling paddock took up the cry, ran with it out to the copper-faced assemblage, crowding the rails, awaiting the parade of the cup horses. As the horses came mincing and prancing out, a cry rose to a shout, Go in and show em Marty. Rocky, go in and show em. Just what Rocky felt in the mood to show him was revealed in his performance on the way up to the barrier. Pig rooting, rearing, paretting, as if still in the breaking yard. The shouting of the Rorys subsided to groans. Those bookies who had watched Rocky's performances at picnic races began to raise the odds. All lay six against the rig, seven, eight to one, Rocky the rig. Not even the Rorys made a move to take the longer odds, and wisely, for there was Rocky pawing the air five yards back from the barrier, when the rest of the field were in place and the starter was raising his hand. They're off. Rocky even had his back turned at that fatal moment, but that sudden tattoo of hoofs was too much even for his willfulness, shrilling alarm at being left behind. He wheeled to follow, leapt into the other's dust. Still, he was several lengths behind a field comprised of the equine aristocracy of the land. A bookie cried, all lay tens against the rig. There were no takers, at least not for a while, not for the first two furlongs. Then as Rocky reached the field and bored into it, there was a rush to take the tens. But could he keep up that terrific pace for the whole eight furlongs? All the bookies began to cry tens against him. The silence of the Rorys broke suddenly. Show em, Rocky, show em. Like a storm, the mass of horse flesh swept thundering and roaring on its way. Shoulder to shoulder, muzzle to rump, flowing tails and tossing manes, and bright silk billowing. Third furlong, the lesser horses falling back, but Rocky going up and up. The odds-on favorites were bunched together, Red Robin on the rails, then the white gelding, then the brown mare, fourth furlong, now all the lesser back and the lead to the odds-on trio, Rocky on the rails behind Red Robin. At the fifth, White Sheik began to fail. Soon Rocky was neck and neck with him and straining for his place between the stallion and the mare. Sixth, the gelding falling back, the rig creeping up between the stallion and the mare, then Arafura star leaping into her terrific stride to pass Red Robin, Rocky leaping after her, Red Robin falling back, the mare was on the rails, Rocky came up to her, muzzle to girth, muzzle to shoulder, into the straight, to bear down upon the milling, straining, yelling crowd, no sound out there but the running thunder of their hoof beats and the roaring of their straining lungs. The foam flakes flew, muzzle to neck still, flaming, straining muzzle of horse to sweat black slender neck of mare. The whips were flailing, the riders lay upon their horses' withers. Past the start of the raging crowd, Aura for a star, Rocky the rig, the rig the favorite. Show em, Rocky, show em. Muzzle to neck still, 
the post. Ara for a star, the favorite wins. Ara for a star. When the horses pulled up a long way down from the crowd, Kangaroy swung to Marty, panting. Hard luck, son, but you'll get it yet. He stretched out his hand. Marty didn't seem to see. Sitting, his heaving mount drooping, with fleshy copper brown features working in the aboriginal way under great emotional stress. When Rocky flinging up his head and shaking it in his fight for normal breathing swung impatiently away, Marty let him have his head, let him go shoving into the other horses, snapping and lashing with hooves. For a moment, King Roy, King Roy sat his own quietly drooping horse, looking after Marty. Then suddenly he jerked up the mare's head and laid spurs to her flanks. She snorted, reared, pawed. He slipped his hand to the weight pouch on the off side of his saddle, pulled the zipper, snatched out the weight, and flung it into the tangle of scrubby growth beyond the rail. The steward, riding through the crowding horses, waved to King Roy and shouted, Great race, Roy. Other riders waved. There could be no congratulating till the win was declared officially after the weighing in. As King Roy rode in to the scales, he glanced at the starting staring Rory clan. They were bunched together, silent, dull-eyed, like people who had suffered a calamity. There was indeed a general air of depression, as if a goodly number of the crowd had taken a plunge on Rocky in those last wild minutes. Few, save the bookies, were smiling. King Arroy was the first on the scales. Within five minutes, the official placings went up on the board. First, Rocky. Second, Red Robin. Third, White Sheik. Arafura, star disqualified. Never was verdict of a Catherine River Cup. Running, received, with so much acclaim. With shouting, dancing, shaking hands all round. Everybody seemed to be in it. Even somewhat glumly, the bookies. No keeping the Rorys out of the grandstand now. Hookie and Marty had to go in to receive the cup from the administrator. The rest of the clan pushed in after them. The pity was that Rocky could not be in it with the family. It was not that he was debarred, but when brought in to be photographed with the aristocracy, turned on the old misanthropy. He had to be taken round the back to the grandstand. Carelessly, those who removed him simply slipped his bridle over a post and dashed back for their share of the glory. Hookie and Marty, and as many of the Rorys as could pack their sh shining faces into the picture, were just posing with the administrator and other officials for the photo that would appear in the Darwin paper when a fearful racket in the liquor bar beneath the grandstand halted the proceedings, those in charge of the catering, for the moment out watching the ceremonial dash back into the bar. To the clanging and banging and splintering of glass was added shouting, all turned to investigate, to be met at the entrance by one of the barmen, shouting, it's that horse, Rocky the Rig, He's at the beer.